Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are very happy to have uh, Kevin uh, Nguyen from King's College London to tell us about his work on holographic boundary actions in ADS3 CFT2 revisited. So please take it away, Kevin. OK, thanks, Dongsheng. Um, so well, first, uh, let me say that I'm quite happy to be here. Uh, and uh, even if it's online, but, uh, and I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. So um, I've been asked to talk about uh, this recent paper from August, whose focus is on uh, various uh, boundary actions in the context of ADS3 uh, gravity uh, that have been discussed. And um, right to so try to explain. Uh, so I will explain uh, the various boundary actions that people have discussed in this context uh, and uh, their role and differences. Um, and in particular, I hope that uh, with this work, some confusion might be uh, resolved. Uh, and so the, um, the starting point that uh, that we can we can adopt is the ADS CFT correspondence, where we uh, we know very well how to handle uh, uh, things. And one question in particular is uh, how do we derive the stress tensor generating functional in the context of ADS three CFT two? Uh, and more particularly from the uh, gravi gravity perspective. So this seems like a very basic question and in principle, uh, we know the answer. So uh, we simply have to follow the ADS CFT dictionary. Uh, so there is this, uh, uh, so the dictionary uh, has been proposed by Gutzer, Klebanov, Polyakov and Witten. So I will refer to it as the GKPW dictionary. And it essentially proposes that the, uh, the partition function with uh, sources on the CFT side, so the generating functional uh, of, the, of the holographic CFT is equal to uh, the path integral on the quantum gravity side, where uh, some boundary conditions have been imposed on the bulk field. And in particular, these boundary conditions are identified with uh, the dual sources of the CFT. Uh, so, it, so for example, you have the bulk metric uh, G mu nu and its boundary value, it's, it's a, a two-dimensional metric. Uh, and this is identified with the background metric for the 2D CFT, which is also the source for the stress tensor. Of course, this um, equality here is at most formal because on the, on the right-hand side, we don't really know what this path integral means. We don't know what uh, are the relevant, relevant fields to path integrate over. We don't really know whether the full quantum uh, gravity theory should be represented as a path integral or whether it only applies semi-classically. So, and sometimes people say that actually the, the left-hand side uh, defines the, the, the quantum gravity theory. Uh, but usually what we do is that we work uh, at large central charge, uh, which co corresponds to the weak gravity uh, regime, uh, in which case we can just approximate this right-hand side by uh, saddle point approximation. So we just have to, uh, given a set of boundary conditions, we have to solve the classical equations of motion. We plug this back into the gravitational action. And uh, this gives us the CFT generating functional at large central charge. Uh, so here I'm interested uh, in this first, well, in, in what I'm, uh, the story I'm telling you here, uh, I'm interested in the stress tensor sector of the CFT. So what I can do is just turn off uh, all other sources uh, apart from the 
uh, the two-dimensional uh, metric, uh, which means that uh, given, well, given that I turn off all sources associated to bulk fields other than the, met the bulk metric, uh, I can just consider pure gravity in ADS3 for that purpose. So now uh, it looks like a very simple computation that uh, one can do. So just uh, consider three-dimensional pure gravity in ADS, solve the equations of motion, plug this back into the action, and there you go. You should have your stress tensor generating function. Uh, however, very, uh, so, and this question has been discussed uh, since the very beginning. But I would say the first papers who have discussed it were relatively mysterious uh, in the sense that they did not apply this straightforward procedure that I was uh, describing. Um, and this is kind of puzzling. But there is actually a, a, well, one paper where this straightforward application of the GKPW dictionary has been uh, given. It's a paper by Carlip from 2005. But quite strangely, uh, Carlip did not discuss it in this context. So he did not give the interpretation of the ADS-CFT correspondence. He did not give uh, this computation, the interpretation of uh, the stress tensor generating functional. And there, there, is a, there is a reason for that, is that he had in mind uh, a topic that is uh, quite different. Uh, he had in mind the Hamiltonian reductions of ADS3 gravity to uh, boundary Liouville theory, which is work uh, back to, that uh, goes back to uh, Poussard, Enou, and Van Peel in 95, so before the ADS-CFT correspondence. And he wanted to, uh, to give another derivation in some sense of, uh, of, this, uh, of this result, so of the boundary Liouville theory. But he, he was quite puzzled because he realized that uh, he got a Liouville theory, but a different one. And I think this, uh, I mean, this shows that there has been a lot of confusion in the field uh, between the ADS-CFT correspondence and uh, these Hamiltonian reductions of pure ADS-3 gravity. And this one goal of, uh, of, this, uh, this, of this paper that I've written is to uh, set the record straight uh, and first review the derivation of the ADS-CFT generating functional uh, a la Carly, but uh, in using the language of the ads t correspondence. Uh, and then uh, as a second step, I, I will uh, review these Hamiltonian reductions and explain uh, what they are and uh, how they differ from uh, the ADS-CFT um, correspondence. And the reason I, I wanted to do this is, well, first of all, because it's always good to uh, well, to, to, to clarify uh, some, some uh, basic computations, but also because these uh, objects have been the, well, have received a lot of attention recently, uh, in particular in the context of one proposal that uh, ADS3 gravity might be dual to an ensemble average of uh, of theories like a random matrix theory or an ensemble of, of CFTs. Uh, and so that's, uh, so at the end of the talk, I, I will uh, reflect on, on these uh, recent proposals. Um, all right, so the outline of, of this talk is the following. I will start by uh, re reviewing in a pure two-dimensional CFT context uh, what is the stress tensor generating functional? It appears that it is universal because of uh, Virasoro symmetry. Uh, and it's known as the Polyakov action. But it also has many other forms. Uh, and it's useful to know what these are. 
uh, depending on, on the context and application. Uh, then uh, I will uh, turn to the ADS CFT dictionary and see how this Polyakov action, so the, the generating function of stress sensor correlation functions, uh, can be derived. Uh, by application of the GKPWD uh, dictionary, and that in the metric form. Uh, then I will do the same, but in the Chern Simons formulation of 3D gravity. And uh, the reason for doing this is that uh, then it will be easier to compare uh, whatever is done in the ADS CFT context with uh, those Hamiltonian reductions of uh, ADS free gravity, since the latter are always done uh, in Chern Simons formulation. Uh, and I will uh, end with the uh, discussion uh, of, of uh, these, uh, these boundary actions, but also uh, with the discussion of their role in recent, uh, recent uh, investigations about uh, ADS CFT, in particular about ensemble averages uh, in that context. Um, so, if you have, by the way, if you have any questions, uh, please ask. I mean, uh, there was one hour, so I think there's time for, for some questions in principle. Um, but okay, if there is no question so far, let me uh, proceed. So, first, Let's look at uh, two-dimensional CFTs, any two-dimensional CFTs. And let's, let's ask the question, what is the generating functional for stress sensor correlation function? So um, if you have the partition function with sources, so the generating functional, you can define the effective action W for this exponential relation. And this will be the generating functional of connected uh, correlation functions. And because of Virazoro symmetry, it happens that in two-dimensional CFTs, the, well, the stress sensor correlation functions are universal up to one number, which is the central choice. Uh, you can think of uh, uh, the conformal world identity. If you, if you know the one point function, you know all higher point functions. Which means that the generating functional W should also be universal up to the value of the central. And one way to construct it is to follow Polyakov. Uh, so you start from the trace anomaly. So you have that the trace of the VEV uh, is proportional to the curvature of the background metric. But by definition, this TIJ here is the functional derivative of W with respect to, uh, to the metric. Uh, and then you can integrate this equation. And uh, the result is uh, the so-called Polyakov action, which as you can see is a non-local functional of the, of the metric since there is a one over uh, Laplacian here. Um, and now if you take, uh, so if you take uh, functional derivatives of the uh, value, you can generate uh, all the connected stress sensor correlates. Uh, there are alternative forms uh, for this Polyakov action that are useful to, to, to keep in mind. So first you can introduce a uh, field phi. Uh, that satisfies the Liouville equation, so box phi equal r. And using this, you can rewrite uh, W as the action for the uh, Liouville theory. But you have to, so you, you always have to remember that phi is not an independent field here. It's a non-local functional of the background metric through uh, the Liouville equation. Something that is interesting to note is that uh, if you ask, the variance of um, the Liouville equation with respect to Valery scalings of the two-dimensional metric, then you conclude that phi must shift under uh, Valery scalings. And therefore, it is the pseudo-Goldstone mode of broken violin bar. Uh, you can also, so starting from 
this form of the Polyakov action, uh, you can compute the VEV of the stress tensor. And uh, quite interestingly, it coincides with the classical stress tensor of the Liouville theorem. And if you take the trace, you, you find the correct uh, trace. Element. So that's a uh, second form of the, of the Polyakov action. But so far, uh, what we've done is that we've assumed um, general coordinate covariance. So here, when we have integrated uh, this equation, uh, at, at all steps, we've, we've assumed uh, that the theory has manifest uh, invariance in the coordinate transformations. But in 2D CFTs, we don't usually care about it. What we care more about is the holomorphic factorization of, uh, the, of the correlation functions. And it happens that the two are actually, uh, they are contradictory. So you cannot realize both at the same time. And the, the obstruction for, uh, the correlation functions to factorize when you use the Polyakov action, uh, the previous Polyakov action uh, comes from contact terms. So the, the, the lack of holomorphicity of a factorization, sorry, of the, of the correlation functions comes from a contact term, which means that you can find a local counter term to the effective action uh, that will remove these contact terms so that will restore uh, factorization of the, of the correlation functions at the cost of losing uh, general covariance. The way to describe this in practice is first to parameterize the two dimensional metric by uh, three free functions, uh, pi and mu and mu bar. Um, and then you can show that the Polyakov action uh, for this parameterization of the two-dimensional metric uh, is the sum of three terms. There's uh, one term that only depends on mu. There is the uh, anti-chiral uh, part of it that only depends on mu bar. These two are non-local functionals of, of mu, and they actually generate the... Um, the chiral uh, correlation function. So the, you know, the correlation function factorized uh, and W mu will generate the chiral part and the w, w bar will generate uh, the anti-chiral part. And this term here is the obstruction to factorization. Uh, it's called the quillen belavin knitznik anomaly. It's a local functional of phi mu and mu bar. And therefore, if you want, you can uh, subtract it to achieve uh, holomorphic factorization. So what does it look like, this uh, chiral generating functional? Um, so if we write mu in terms of uh, some function f through what we call the Beltrami equation, then it takes this form. But uh, f is a non-local functional of mu. So this, again, is a non-local functional of mu. And uh, related or common that uh, will be useful uh, later on in the talk is that this action is also the action for two-dimensional quantum gravity, the, the one of Polyakov that was discussed in the 90s in the light cone gauge. And the reason is uh, very simple. So uh, in that different context, this action is not considered a generating functional for a CFT, but it's viewed as, uh, as describing a two-dimensional dynamical metric. So it's describing two-dimensional quantum gravity. But then because of diffeomorphism invariance, you can set two of the three functions to zero. So you can set phi to zero, you can set mu to zero, and then uh, this term disappears, this term disappears, and you have indeed that uh, the Polyakov action is equal to this 
uh, to this uh, chiral action. But that uh, comment that we can uh, put in parentheses for, for now. There is yet another uh, version of the Polyakov action uh, where you introduce the inverse uh, of the function f for this equation. And then the Polyakov action becomes, uh, well, takes this form, which is actually the geometric action discussed by Alexey Shetashvili that describes uh, the motion of a particle on the vacuum quadrant orbit of the Virasov. It's a nonlinear realization of uh, Virasov symmetry, and in some sense, it's a two dimensional analog of the short term theory. Right, so um, these are the various forms that the generating functional for stress tensor correlation functions take into dimensions. And now the question is, uh, how do, do you derive either one of them from the ADS-CFT uh, correspondence by application of the GKPW dictionary? So let's do that first in the metric form. Uh, so we start by uh, describing the solution space of pure 3D gravity. So we pick, as usual, the performance gram gauge. Uh, and then uh, this function gij here, uh, we expand it in powers of rho. Rho equals 0 is the location of the conformal boundary. And in three dimensions, something uh, special happens is that the expansion truncates uh, at this order, rho squared. The reason being that uh, three-dimensional gravity is uh, topological, so there is no bulk degree of freedom. Uh, so the expansion truncates. And here, the leading order here, g naught, and that I will uh, call g tilde in what follows, uh, is the boundary metric. So it's the, the background metric for the dual CFT. And when we use Einstein's equations, we can constrain uh, the other two functions. So uh, G2 is constrained uh, so to be of this form, where Tij is a divergent-less tensor, two-dimensional tensor, and it has a trace proportional to uh, the, the boundary curvature. And so it's very, uh, I mean, you can easily imagine that this Tij is actually the stress tensor of the, of the, two, of the 2D CFT. Uh, and then G4 uh, is uh, explicitly given in terms of G2 and G3. All right. Um, this is, however, not the end of the story because as I was already explaining that um, in the case of, well, in the context of 2D CFTs, the stress tensor generating functional is very uh, tightly related to uh, boundary scales. So you know, there is, you can write uh, the Polyakov action as a Liouville theory, where the Liouville field is actually the pseudo Gaussian mode of broken by invariance. So it's a very good idea to. Uh, ask how is how are boundary binary scalings realized uh, in the ball. And this is actually known. So there are those Penrose, Brown, and No diffeomorphisms that act um, as binary scalings at the conformal boundary. So this is the action of binary scalings at the boundary. And as usual, the diffeomorphisms can be uh, parametrized by a change of coordinate. So it's, in this case, it's just a uh, leading order. It's just a rescaling of the radial coordinate by some arbitrary function. Um, but you see that here, uh, this value rescalings changes the, the boundary metric. So that means that you cannot impose uh, I mean, a priori, you cannot impose Dirichlet conditions. Because if you impose Dirichlet conditions, then that means that uh, you're not allowing for 
or via rescalings to act within the solution space, which might be problematic. Uh, and indeed, what has been shown by, by Carly is that in order to get the Polyakov action, you need to take into account uh, this freedom here. So the way he has done it is uh, to allow the boundary cutoff surface that we usually put at uh, rho equal epsilon to uh, satisfy a more general equation. So here we're gonna put our cutoff surface at rho equal epsilon. So this is the UV regulator, the IR regulator uh, from the bulk uh, perspective. Uh, times some uh, free function. And this omega here shifts under uh, viral risk here. So because of that, uh, uh, we can expect it to, we can expect this degree of freedom to turn out to be the Liouville field of the dual C. Um, and there are, uh, well, order epsilon square corrections and the whole thing I decide to, to call exponential 2h, but that's just for convenience. So this is the picture. Usually uh, we put the cutoff surface at rho equal epsilon, and this is a rigid boundary. But uh, what we actually need to do if we want to recover the correct generating function, functional for stress sensor correlators is that we need to put the cutoff surface at, uh, at, a, at a boundary location that is allowed to uh, fluctuate. So now um, we can look at the, I mean, we can apply the GKPW dictionary. So we look at the action for gravity. There was the einstein hilbert action, there was the given smoking term. Uh, and we have to evaluate it on shell. So when we do that, uh, this is what we get, taking into account that the cutoff surface uh, is not straight, but uh, is, is curved and parameterized by rho equal to h. So we see here uh, that there is a divergence when you send rho to infinity, and that can be cured with the usual counter term uh, introduced by Bela Subramanian and, and Krauss. Uh, then there is a logarithmic divergence, uh, which actually is not important because it uh, multiplies a topological term. So uh, this is just a Euler characteristic, square root gr integrated over the boundary. So we're not going to worry about this. Uh, and then we can look at the renormalized action. So take uh, the regulated action plus the counter term and send the UV regulator to zero. And what we get is the Liouville action where indeed omega that parameterizes the location of the, of the boundary surface uh, plays the role of the Liouville field. Then you have to, uh, to evaluate omega on shell and you recover the proper Polyakov action with the correct coefficient. Um, so as you can see, in most of the, I mean, this point that the vial mode uh, has, that, that parameterizes the, the location of the boundary surface, the fact that this has to be, this has to be taken into account has been overlooked in most of the literature, except in Carlip's paper, which is not very well known. Um, but in fact, there is no way around it if you want to properly recover the, the generating function of stress tensor correlation. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Um,
So now in order to be able to compare with uh, Hamiltonian reductions and discuss uh, Hamiltonian reduction, reductions later, let me just uh, do the same exercise in Trent Simon's formulation of pure gravity. So Trent Simon's formulation of pure gravity uh, is a first order of formulation. So you, you first need uh, the dry bind uh, that is the square root of the metric and the associated spin connection. And then you can take uh, linear combinations of those and construct two gauge fields valued in the SL2R or SL2,1 algebra. So these GA here uh, are the, the algebra generators. And you can write down uh, a churn Simon's action for these gauge fields. And further, you can show that if you take the difference of the chiral transignments action and the, uh, the difference with the anti chiral action, then this is just the Einstein Hilbert action written in first order variables up to some boundary. In particular, uh, they, they have the same bulk equation, those two, those two ways of uh, those two theories. So then there is the question, how do we describe the solution space of 3D gravity in these variables? Um, so for that, uh, well, we have to follow Banyados, Chandia, and Ritz paper from 2002. So first, what we can do is solve the spatial constraints of the theory by writing A as um, the, the gauge transformation of generated by some uh, group element H of some purely transverse and R independent uh, connection. So here, what happens is that uh, there is this purely transverse and R independent, so radial independent connection. And then uh, I do a gauge transformation on it that uh, reinstates some um, R dependence in the game. And if I reconstruct the dry bind uh, and then the metric uh, following this, uh, this ansatz, uh, I, find, I directly find that uh, it takes the Pfefferman gram form, truncated at the right order. Uh, and the only missing ingredient is the constraint on G2. Uh, and this follows from solving uh, the evolution equation. So then um, the boundary conditions are naturally encoded by these conditions on the, on the transignments field uh, and the associated action to consider take this form. And again, you can evaluate it on shell taking into account that uh, the, the cutoff boundary um, is not straight, but parameterized by some vile mode. Uh, you find that uh, it diverges, and you can use the exact same counter term to cancel the divergence. And um, then you compute the renormalized on shell action. And again, you get the Liouville theory with, uh, however, a slightly different coefficients. So there are uh, changes in the signs and factor one half. But when you evaluate omega on shell, so you vary this action to find its equation of motion and plug it back into the action, then you find the, Polyaf the Polyakov action with uh, the right coefficient again. So this is kind of a slightly non-trivial agreement between uh, the two formulations, the metric one and the transcend. Uh, all right. So having discussed a bit uh, this Trent Simons formulation, I can now discuss the Hamiltonian reductions that have been the source of the confusion. Kevin, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, say again, Dongshen. I, I want to ask you, um, can you comment a bit more on the two formalisms, this metric formalism and the uh, uh, Trent Simons formalism? Um, like, I mean, uh, it's just 
that uh, you use different variables to describe pure gravity. So there is the metric formalism for gravity, but there is also a first order formalism where you have a dry bind and um, so uh, frame fields and uh, spin connection. Um, and then you can, there are, in three dimensions, you can repackage that into uh, Chern Simon's uh, theory. It's just a different way of organizing the, the variables. But as you can see, it's just a different way to write, of writing the same thing. But like here, how do you put uh, the boundary cutoff in, in this Chern Simon's formalism? Oh, I mean, you still have a notion of coordinates. You still have coordinates. Uh, there is a this coordinate R. Um, I mean, you don't have the metric field, but you still have dependence on coordinates, and you can actually reconstruct the metric from uh, the gauge connection. So here it is, and I just do the same as in the metric formalism. I put a cutoff at rho equal epsilon times exponential to omega. And that's where my, my cutoff is. OK, I see. Thanks. So it's just that we've exchanged the metric for, for this gauge connection. It's not, it's not deeper than that. Sorry, can I ask a question? Uh, sure. So uh, are the boundary terms precisely the gibbon hawking term? Uh, no. So, yeah, so there is, there is a, a um, indeed, so it's not, this action is not equal to the Einstein-Hilbert uh, Einstein action plus Gibbon's Hawking. There is a, it's, yeah, there is a, it's instead of being, uh, so you can actually, work out the relation, but instead of having one over k squared here, there, was, there may be a factor one half or something like that. It's a bit different. Because you're using different variables, so your variational principle produces different boundary terms. But okay, very, but uh, I mean, very non-trivially, you still get the same divergences, so you can still use the exact same counter term, and uh, you still produce the, the exact same boundary action. Even though you started with uh, a theory that had uh, different um, boundary terms. Um, <clears throat> so do you think of it as precisely the same action, or do you think of it as two different actions which reduce to to like action of a similar form? So the starting point is different, but uh, they both give the same Polyakov action at, at the end of the day, once you integrate out the Liouville mode. But it's on, on, only after you integrate out the Liouville mode that you get both give C over 96 pi, integral d square x uh, r one over box r. OK, I see. Thank you. Sure. Uh, all right. So now let me discuss these Hamiltonian reductions and what they mean. And in particular, one confusion that uh, was particularly uh, obvious in Carlip's paper is that um, in both, so in both the ADS CFT reduction and in the Hamiltonian reduction, there is a Liouville theory. And then the question is, uh, is this the same Liouville theory? And Carlip was puzzled because he found that uh, the two Liouville theories are unequivalent. And he, uh, he speculated on uh, what is the origin of this and how can this be resolved. But what I want to argue here is that 
uh, it should not be surprising that those two living theories do not agree with each other because in fact, they describe completely different things. Uh, so these Hamiltonian reductions, um, there are basically, uh, so there, there, are, there are basically a reductions of the gravitational action for some specific uh, ansatz of the of, for the metric. So this is the ansatz that is adopted. Here you see that the boundary geometry is flat. It's just dz dz bar. Uh, and then there's only uh, two free functions, l and l bar, uh, which for on shell solutions should be uh, respectively holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. But here we, we don't assume this yet. So we work uh, still off shell. Um, then what we're going to do is that we're going to consider uh, the Chern Simons formulation of 3D gravity with uh, particular boundary condition, AT equal A5, where Z is T plus phi and Z bar is T minus phi. Uh, this boundary condition is satisfied by this ansatz, but uh, notice that um, it is not satisfied in the most, more general case that I discussed previously. So in particular, this, uh, this boundary condition could not be applied uh, in ADS CFT. Here it can be applied because we, we chose uh, a particular boundary geometry. So then the next step is to, uh, well, use the Trans simons formulation for 3D gravity, solve uh, the spatial constraint, and get to two chiral Wazumino uh, Novikov Witten models. Then, originally, what Kusar and Nguyen Van Riel did is that they combined those two chiral uh, Wazumino model, models into a single non chiral one. And then, uh, using uh, restrictions coming from the ansatz, they reduce it to the flat, to some what I call flat Liouville theory, because the background metric. Uh, on the boundary is flat. Uh, there is something uh, annoying in that um, uh, in that uh, combination of two chiral Wazumino models into a non-chiral one is that um, you kind of lose track of the original variable. So you don't really know anymore uh, what the result means in terms of gravitational variable. Fortunately, there is an alternative way to, to get to this uh, end result. Um, and uh, that's what I'm gonna uh, review here. So first you solve the constraints. Um, so this can be done by writing A, the spatial components of the, of the gauge fields as G minus one DG. But because of, uh, the Pfefferman gram ansatz, um, well, the Pfefferman gram gauge that you want to reach, you can just write J as the product of uh, a T phi dependent group element and uh, the H of R that we had previously. So uh, some specific R dependent gauge element, uh, group element. So all we need to do is to uh, parameterize the most general uh, small G here. And this is done in this way. So uh, for each generator of the algebra, you associate a T phi dependent function, and that parameterizes the most general uh, SO2 one group element that you can write. Uh, and then you check whether uh, this satisfies your ansatz. And in fact, you find that uh, you need some relations between those fields here. So you need sigma prime to be exponential pi and phi prime to be uh, minus 2t. Then you plug uh, everything back into the churn simons action. Uh, because of the two constraints that I just showed, you can eliminate everything in terms of phi. And you find just a free chiral theory. Uh, 
this is a, a, a massless free chiral boson. Um, and in order to get to the original result of Poussard, Eno, and Van Drill, what you have to do is to combine, to combine the chiral and antichiral fields, pi and pi bar, into uh, the Liouville field through something called backloon transformation. Uh, it's not too important. Uh, and you get to this, uh, to this action, which is indeed a Liouville theory. Uh, it's a flat Liouville theory in the sense that there is no curved metric here, but it differs from the Liouville theory that I was uh, discussing in the context of ADS-CFT in that there is a potential profile, an exponential potential. Um, and okay, so Karolip was uh, wanted to, to compare his result to uh, this Liouville action. And of course, uh, he found that there is a discrepancy due to this potential. But I think uh, it is important to emphasize that uh, those two actions de describe completely different things. So here we're still off shell. We have a flat boundary metric and we're still off shell. In fact, if we use the remaining bulk equation of motion, which is d bar phi equals zero, you directly see that the churn simons action just vanishes. So uh, this implies that this difference also vanishes. So you get zero if you go fully on shell, which in fact agrees with uh, the, the action we had the Polyakov action we had um, before, because if you set the boundary metric to be flat uh, in the Polyakov action, then you get also zero. But uh, okay, so what we have to, to understand is that this phi L here, this Liouville field uh, in the ADS CFT correspondence, it really describes the curvature of the boundary metric here. What it describes is actually the dynamics of, uh, of this off-shell mode here, L and L bar. So Kevin, Kevin I, have a, I have a question. Uh, uh, yes, Mika? Um, so so if, you, if you think about ADS3 holography in the, in the metric formulation, um, yes. you can, um, well, include or not include the volume uh, counter term, right? Uh, so like the volume counter term is, is needed in order to renormalize this, this stress tensor and, and, and get the finite, uh, uh, basically Polyakov action, I would say. But you don't have to do this, right? Oh, sorry, yeah, you, you don't have to do this, right? You, you, you can keep the, I mean, you can not add the, the volume counter term. Uh, this here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The action is going to be divergent, but like as you stay on the UV cutoff, like it's it's not such a big deal after all. And yeah. I'm wondering if the renormalization procedure uh, on the gravity side and in this turn samples formulation that you've been describing is the same. Because if it's not the same, maybe like you know, like this 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 potential term that you generate is it just comes from from including or not including something related to the volume counter term. No, actually, uh, in both approaches, the counter term is the same. Okay, okay, okay. So, I mean, no, in this I case, think, probably I mean, you should ignore my comment. Yes. Say again? I mean, in this case, you probably should ignore my comment because uh, it was about including or not including this in, in both cases. Yeah. So. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear that, that uh, the discrepancy simply comes from the fact that they describe different, different structures in the bulk. So here, this, this describes an off-shell uh, mode, this, this L functions that I had in the metric, um, while um, in the Polyakov action, you don't have the, this potential, but Polyakov action parameterizes the boundary curvature. So, so I think, I mean, that's, that's the point. They should not be confused. Uh, so then there is um, yet another Hamiltonian reduction that has been discussed uh, recently by Kotler and Jensen, which basically differs from uh, 
the one of Kusar and one Van Driel by a different parameterization of the group element G. And it yields uh, this different action that we see here, uh, which can be identified with the geometric action uh, on the first quadrant, first exceptional quadrant orbit of the Virasol group. Or said differently, it's uh, this W mu that I had in the first part of the talk. Uh, after uh, doing some change of variable, from F to exponential minus I phi, which is adapted to cylinder, uh, to, to a cylinder representation of the CFT. Uh, and that's, um, yeah, and that's again an off shell action. So if you use the remaining bulk equation of motion, then this also uh, gives zero. But here again, there is a potential source of confusion because. Here you get, uh, so again, this, this, this is off shell and does not describe boundary curvature. However, it has exactly the same form as the, uh, as the Polyakov action, this W mu generating function. But in, in principle, they describe different. Uh, all right, so now after having reviewed um, these, these various boundary actions, let me uh, give a few comments and then uh, discuss uh, a few uh, applications. Uh, mm -hmm. So first of all, if we just think about ADS-CFT for a moment um, and the generating function of stress sensor correlation functions, Something uh, interesting is happening is that although we compute uh, the generating functional in the large central charge limit, the result is actually exact. And this, I mean, the reason for this is, is simple is that uh, whether at large C or small C, the, gener the stress sensor generating functional in 2D CFT is the same up to the value of C. But I think this is interesting because that means that even if you work at small c, uh, so including quantum gravity effects in ADS3, at the end of the day, all these quantum gravity effects can only affect the end result through renormalization of c. So that means that there is, uh, one can imagine that there is some uh, very constraining structure, even in quantum gravity, uh, due to the other symmetry. And it would be interesting to, to investigate. Um, then you can ask about higher dimensions. What happens, for example, in ADS5? Well, in ADS5, uh, you're dual to a four dimensional CFT. And there, there is not only one possible set of uh, stress, stress sensor correlation functions. In fact, uh, there are many because you don't have the other symmetry. So there are not uh, as many constraints. Uh, so in principle, you need many coefficients to parameterize the landscape of uh, stress sensor correlation functions. However, there is only one parameter in pure gravity, as G Newton in ADS uh, units. So does that mean that uh, holography can only accommodate for one particular set of uh, stress tensor correlation functions? Uh, and if not, uh, where do, I mean, where, where do the other parameters uh, sit? Uh, so that's, uh, that's an interesting question, I think. Uh, and that's something that uh, I have started thinking about. Then uh, <clears throat> coming back to Hamiltonian reductions. Uh, so let me again emphasize that Hamiltonian reductions uh, are off shell and therefore 
they don't have the, the interpretation coming from the GKP the dictionary. So there is, I think, no straightforward interpretation of Hamiltonian reduction within ADC. Although these have been used uh, in that context too, but I think it's not very clear what uh, the status of these, uh, of these manipulations. Uh, related to that, people have uh, looked at Hamiltonian reductions in case where you have multiply connected uh, boundaries, aka wormholes. Uh, but it would seem uh, interesting to also look at uh, generating functional. So just the on-shell action uh, that yields the Polyakov action for the one-sided case, but in the case where you have wormholes and see what they tell us about stress tensor correlation functions in that context. Uh, and something also interesting is that um, the same geometric action uh, that we had uh, a couple of slides before has been derived from Hamiltonian reductions of the Sitter three gravity and also four-dimensional flat gravity. So whatever we can learn about, uh, about Hamiltonian reductions in ADS three, can be straightforwardly applied to three-dimensional decitor and four-dimensional flat space gravity, which of course is uh, of great interest. So, okay, after this uh, few comments, let me go to, uh, well, if I have time, uh -huh. okay. Um, so let me be quick about this. So about at least one uh, interesting topic, which is that of ensemble averaging uh, in ADS-3. So there is a very interesting paper written by Jordan Cutler and Kirsten Johnson uh, in 2020. Uh, and they, so they, um, they claim to compute spectral statistics of BTC black holes from, um, from this Hamiltonian reduction. So by this, what I have in mind is uh, what we have heard a lot about uh, in recent years and months, uh, is that you imagine not having just one single uh, theory, but an ensemble of uh, theories like an ensemble of CFTs or random matrix theories maybe, and uh, computing correlations between uh, realizations of uh, the partition functions so drawn from uh, this ensemble theory and then uh, average over, well, uh, look at the average value of these correlations. Um, and, so when you take uh, such uh, connected correlation function, this actually encodes information about uh, spectral statistics of the system. So what they have done in this paper is that uh, they have essentially uh, done this Hamiltonian reduction, but in the case of uh, two connected boundaries, so in the case where you have a wormhole in the middle, they end up with uh, a modification of this action. So essentially two uh, coupled uh, such actions. Then they, um, they quantize it. So they do path integral quantization of uh, these actions with a certain measure. And uh, from that, they, uh, well, they compute uh, those correlation functions. And the results, interestingly, are found to agree with a double-scaled uh, random matrix ensemble, uh, which leads them to uh, suggest that maybe pure ADS-3 gravity is actually dual, uh, not to a single CFT, but to uh, an ensemble of random, well, to a random matrix theory or an ensemble 2D CFT. So I think here, um, 
we should be careful because as I was mentioning before, those Hamiltonian reductions, they do not follow from the standard GKPW dictionary. So it's not clear what the status of, uh, to me at least, what the status of these computations is. Uh, however, um, one can actually uh, give a different interpretation of their computation within the ADS-CFT dictionary. So for that, remember that the boundary action they have uh, derived is actually identical to the generating functional of stress tensor correlation functions. Said so differently is the partition function with sources. And then their path integral uh, is just an integration over the boundary sources. So I think this suggests uh, this alternative story in which uh, you have a duality between ADS3 gravity and a 2D CFT, a single 2D CFT. But then you decide uh, to average over the boundary sources in that uh, 2D CFT. And doing this averaging, uh, you find that uh, the observables that you get in this ensemble that you've constructed agree with another ensemble, a double-scaled random matrix ensemble. So I think uh, this, at least to me, seems a much less uh, shocking uh, statement than uh, what they have proposed first. Uh, because it allows to, um, uh, to, to, to save the usual uh, ADS CFT correspondence, where you have duality with a single CFT. Uh, an additional comment is that uh, doing this average over the boundary source mu is also equivalent uh, to doing two dimensional Polyakov quantum gravity at the boundary in the light cone game. And that goes back to the comment. I made at the beginning that this W mu is actually the action for a 2D quantum gravity. Uh, so here, uh, what we, an additional uh, well, result that we get from, from, this, uh, from this reasoning is that 2D Polyakov quantum gravity uh, seems to agree with a double scale random matrix ensemble. Uh, Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about this. Um, then maybe a last, uh, last slide. So there is a recurring uh, theme here is that this action W mu seems to have uh, to appear in two different ways from ADS3 gravity, either as a generating functional, uh, so parametrizing the, the boundary curvature, or as uh, an effective action for some of the degrees of freedom in the box, but not those associated with a boundary curvature. And one can ask, uh, does this also happen in 2D CFT? And the answer is actually yes. So one role is the generating function for stress tensor correlation functions, but the same action has also appeared in the context of effective descriptions of uh, stress tensor sector of 2D CFTs, in particular in effective descriptions of Virasoro identity blocks and maximally chaotic uh, OTOCs, which are related by uh, analytic continuation. Uh, in these uh, series of uh, very interesting papers, uh, so this effective description uh, relies on the same action. The field F is called the reparameterization mode and has also been identified with the shadow of the stress tensor. And uh, in uh, some paper from January uh, of this year, uh, I wanted to clarify um, whether there is a direct relation between the two views on the same object W mu, and it, appear, it appears that there is. So you can actually start from um, 
from uh, w of mu as a generating functional uh, and then write so from that you can derive the stress tensor correlation functions but you can write them in such a way that they look like exchange of uh, some reparameterization mode uh, and this you can use to to construct uh, well any four point function that looks looks like this so with arbitrary number of stress tensor exchanges. And this effectively can be, well, you, you effectively see appearing before your eyes um, the rules of this, uh, of this effective uh, description. So that's uh, another point I wanted to, uh, to mention. Uh, OK, I think I'm out of time. So I'm going to stop here. Um, thank you. Thanks for the thank nice you. talk, Kevin. Uh, though we have received some questions uh, during the talk, but probably oh, okay. we can still get some uh, questions now. Yeah, sure. Anyone would like to start? Okay, maybe I can start. Um, so you talked about the difference between, uh, like there is a discrepancy between, say, the metric or uh, the, the first order formalism with the Hamiltonian truncation. But, but um, can that be cured or it's really two different approaches? Uh, so, wait, so uh, just to, to, to clarify in here, um, so first I discussed uh, the ADS-CFT uh, dictionary in metric and uh, Trent Simons formulation. There, um, there is perfect agreement at the end of the day, although you use two different uh, kind of thing you formulation of the, of the of 3D gravity. And then there, is, there are those Hamiltonian reductions, uh, which although have been confused with uh, generating functionals, the ADS CFT correspondence actually describe something completely different. So there, it's always uh, it's always done in Trent Simon's formulation, but you describe something different. So at the end of the day, your action, your Liouville action, what it really describes is this uh, function L here that sits at subleading order, while the Polyakov action uh, and Liouville version thereof that I was discussing in the first part, uh, they parameterize um, curvature, uh, I mean, uh, curved background metrics that sit at leading order here. So they, they, look, all, they look almost almost the same, but they describe different objects. Yes, because the, in this, um... Mm, Hamiltonian reduction, actually, the boundary metric is fixed to be flat. Exactly. And uh, actually, I see that you use the Banyados um, and that's, and, but uh, you see that for me, I feel when you have, okay, when we talk about the, the Liouville, uh, Liouville theory as a conformal field theory, right? Actually, we, we need the, the potential term. Yes, like so the, the one that you, you have uh, obtained this potential term, right? Yeah, so here, okay, one way to, 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 to say that, I guess, is that um, when you do this Hamiltonian reduction, what you're actually describing are these dynamical modes, whose dynamics is, is, is uh, very simple, but they are still dynamical. Uh, and the, the aerodynamics is that of uh, Liouville theory, which can be quantized. Uh, on the other hand, so these are our dynamical fields. That's the important part. On the other hand, in, uh, in this action that I have here, uh, which is the Polyakov action written in Liouville form, 
phi and the metric here are not dynamical. They're background structures that you vary in order to generate the, the stress tensor correlation functions of a sieve. But this should not be quantized. It, it, yeah, in principle, it, sh it should not be quantized. You, you, you see the difference? Yeah, I, I see the difference. The, the thing, um, my point was that it seems to me that from the Hamiltonian truncation, we get some more CFT like theory. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I I agree with that. And this, I mean, that's why people were quite excited with the work of uh, Kusar and Nguyen Van Driel beginning in 95, because they thought, oh, that's really nice. We get, I mean, we see that effectively three-dimensional gravity reduces to uh, a 2D CFT. But, um, and, and I agree, it's, it's quite interesting, but it should also be emphasized that this does not uh, fit within the usual ADS CFT dictionary. Because ADS three gravity is not, I mean, there was no, it's not dual to, to, to the Leuven theory. We actually don't know what it what it is dual to, but it's certainly much more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah. So the holographics. So somehow, what I know is that um, we don't really have an explicit model of an holographic CFTs. Or uh, we well, we have. A, I would say we haven't identified the two D CFT, but we. I mean, we can access some information through uh, string theory, like with uh, D1, D5 uh, brains, uh, this, this type of construction. Yeah, I mean, in, in ADS3, CFT2. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. So can you expand a bit more about what happens in higher dimensions? Or, or I would imagine that what you've discussed is very special to Reducing uh, yeah, from indeed, three to two dimensions. Yeah, so in two dimensions, um, you have Virazoro symmetry, which means that all stress tensor correlation functions are fixed up to the value of the central charge. But this is not true uh, in four dimensions, for example. Uh, there, you know that the anomaly coefficients fix only one, two, and three point functions. Uh, but for higher point functions, you have much more freedom in principle. So although in two dimensions, uh, you have a one-to-one -one map, map between the, the only coefficient, which is C and uh, G Newton in 3D gravity, you don't have that anymore in, uh, in five dimensions. So uh, the question is, um, does that mean that holographic CFTs are, uh, are parameterized by only one coefficient to G Newton? Or does that mean that we actually need uh, more fields in the bulk in, the, in order to describe more general uh, sets of stress tensor correlation functions? This is, I mean, it's not completely obvious to me. I guess the answer would be the second one, but uh, we don't have a precise argument. Well, one question might be is what pure gravity in the bulk would give you in the boundary? Yeah, so you, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the first question that, uh, yeah, that I would like to answer. What do you get from pure gravity? Um, and, um, and then the second question is how, uh, what do you need to do in order to get something more general? Um, hello, Kevin. I have another question. Yeah. Um, so when you go from the bulk to the boundary uh, theory, you of course on one side you're reducing the 
um, metric, or the, like the metric on the space itself. But you, but I mean, there's also something happening on the target space, so to speak. I mean, the, um, I mean, you have first you have joint Simons, and then you have gauge fields which are valued in the algebra of SL two R. Yes. But on the UV field theory, your field, uh, the target space is just a real line. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, can, can you maybe give any, like, do you have any interpretation of this also the target space point of view? I mean, you need to take, um, go well, ready available it's, to it's infinity, really, but. I, I mean, I think it's really just a technical fact. Uh, so here indeed you just, you construct uh, a gauge field that is valued in some, uh, some non-trivial algebra. But then you see for the action, you take the trace. So you reduce the action to some uh, real number. Um, it just so happens that the equations of motion, but as you can see here, it just so happens that, that when you do that, uh, there is actual, actually an equality between the Trent Simons action and the Einstein Hilbert action when you translate between variables. So you see here, you plug in A uh, in terms of the spin connection in the Dribein. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when you do that on the right-hand side, what you find is the Einstein-Hilbert action in first order of variable. It's the Palatini action. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I don't have uh, more to say. Mm -hmm. I think. Okay, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, for hello? okay, go ahead, Rodrigo. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. So, uh, you said that uh, Kotler and Jensen, they uh, computed some sort of correlation function and, and led them to conclude that uh, it was due to an ensemble uh, yes. or a random matrix, matrix thing. Uh, yeah. So is there something peculiar, some peculiar aspect about the result that led them to believe this as opposed to being an average over a single theory? Well, if, if you have a single theory, there is no average. Um, so here, I mean, the, the reasoning goes very, much uh, along the lines of uh, what has been done in the context of JT gravity versus SYK. Um, so in that context, people have uh, wondered about the, the role of uh, gravitational solutions with uh, multiple, multiply connected boundaries, these wormholes. Uh, and so when you have a, when you have two, two boundaries, uh, that means that you have uh, two, two CFT, right? Or two, I mean, two dual uh, theories. But the question is whether uh, these are uh, just two dis like disconnected copies or whether they are connected in some way. And the bulk picture suggests that they are connected. So one way to connect uh, those two copies is to draw them from an ensemble and then average over the ensemble. Uh, then you, you, by doing this, you effectively generate uh, correlations between uh, different copies of the theory. So this is what is done here. Um, and so Kotler and Jensen, they had the same philosophy in the context of ADS-3 gravity. They said, uh, let's look at um, multiply connected boundaries. Uh, let's apply the Hamiltonian reduction. We get uh, some effective bulk theory. Let's quantize it. And then uh, let's see what kind of observable we get. And the observable they get can be matched to uh, this connected um, correlation function in a random matrix ensemble. So that, that's their statement. 
but so so what was your proposal uh, alternative interpretation oh okay so my alternative interpretation is just to say um let's forget about the hamiltonian reduction let's just consider two uh copies of uh, of the dual cft of the cft that is dual to ads3 gravity uh, but then let's average uh over the boundary sources. Uh, and effectively, you're doing the same computation as, as they have done, because, because it happens that uh, their action that they quantize also coincides with uh, the generating function of stress tensor poly. So you use the same object, but you interpret it differently. This is, you know, this. This mu here should be interpreted as a boundary source in interpretation I propose. While uh, in their uh, picture, this mu here is, uh, is a bulk field, dynamical bulk field that they quantize. But, but in my uh, interpretation, the integral that they perform here is an explicit averaging over the boundary sources. So when you do an explicit average over a theory, you should not be too surprised that it matches onto an ensemble average theory rather than single theory. But that, that's, my, that, that's my point. But OK, I mean, I think there was I think their proposal uh, is perfectly good. It's just that I, for me, it's, uh, it does not follow from the usual rules of the ADS-CFT correspondence. So, um, and also the claim the, the, or the, the end result uh, uh, is in some sense in tension with everything we've known about ADS-3-CFT2 before. So in this alternative interpretation, you just use the usual ADS-CFT uh, correspondence. You do an explicit averaging over the boundary sources, but you, you, you effectively you're doing the same computation. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks. So Kevin. Uh, <laughs> I just thought about the answer. I mean, if you cannot say more to it, it's uh, personally fine. But uh, I would like to make the comment that I'm, I do not think that this is just like uh, technicality in the sense that you just trace over it and what comes out is one dimensional. I mean, there's a difference between, um, I mean, you start off with a field which, uh, yeah. So I think my point is what I want to say is that uh, uh, you're actually reducing the target space. And I think this is non trivial. The principle of the trace still would, could depend on also, um, like not only the spin connection, but also the other parts. But what this result actually says that the UV theory in the end only depends on one field which with target space in the real line. And uh, which is not just, which is, I think it's not just coming from that you're taking the trace over these connections. Um, yeah, I'm not, not sure how to answer this. Um... Kevin. Yeah. Uh, so I will I will stop recording now and then okay. we, we can still continue if you have time. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, no problem. Okay. <laughs>